Hello, everyone, and welcome back to DBR with CBR. That is right. It is time once again for Dragon Ball Rewatch. And if you are watching along with us, you can watch along on Crunchyroll and Hulu, and you can read along on the English translation on Made by Viz Media. Once again, we are your hosts. My name is Alex Maglio. I'm John Greenall. And I'm Sam Stone. <laughs> We're here to talk about a very special mountain today. But, uh... John, if you want to give us the rundown. Sure. This is the Ox King on Fire Mountain. Uh, Japanese air date, April 9th, 1986. American first air date, October 21st, 1995. We've jumped forward a bit now because uh, a lot of the dubs gave up before this point. And it's adapting two chapters and Into the Fire and In Search of Kame Sinhen. Or Sien, I'm probably saying that incorrectly. But yeah, two chapters. So, yeah. A lot of material, a lot of material covered in this in this uh, episode. And considering that we get like more filler with Pilaf, and we get the introduction of of the Ox King and and Chi Chi. I mean, who especially Chi Chi, who looms very importantly in the Dragon Ball mythos moving forward. Oh yeah, I do. Point... Intru- oh, go oh. go ahead. I do want to point out about Chi- we were ta- just going into Chi Chi's introduction when we she's getting chased by the dinosaur in the same way that Gohan is getting chased when we see him later on, and I really love that little visual callback in the Z form to uh, Chi Chi with Gohan getting chased by that dinosaur. I was going to bring that up as well. That's such a, a weird because I remember Chi Chi starting this episode, but I'd forgotten how she was introduced. Like, how does she come into this? Oh, right, literally just. Enter stage left, pursued by T Rex, which is the best way to introduce a character. It's it's so good, and I love her. I also love that we got a confirmation from Yamcha that he only likes women his own age. We stand a non problematic king. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I you know, and I love. I mean, Chi Chi has a rough go of it though, right? I mean, almost eaten by a T Rex and then knocked Yamcha. by Yamcha. <laughs> Yeah, he axe handles her in the back of the head. That man <laughs> was striking to kill. He yeah. full on when Captain Kirk on her. He just shoot, like fighting the Gorn. I love how they don't even shy away from that because when they because also basically the plot of this episode is they arrive at Fire Mountain, everyone arrives, and Goku is basically told, "Go find Chi Chi and then go find Master Roshi." Of course, by that point, Yamcha's already met Chi Chi, knocked her unconscious, and has to go and find her to wake her up. But their first thing when they see her is, "Oh, she's still breathing." Like, I love that they don't even shy away from the fact Yamcha is very sure he just murdered a child. <laughs> Straight up. While, while we're talking about episode seven, the Ox King of Fire Mountain, I mean, you know, we've talked about Yamcha potentially having killed people in unseen adventures. Um, how many people do you think the Ox King killed? <laughs> oh, I was under the impression that he, like, murdered, like, a lot of people like i was very much under that impression that his legend had spread very far i mean based on his carbon footprint he is doomed billions with that fire that's because whole villages around that have burnt down people presumably live there but the timing I mean, on that's weird because it's made out like it's only been a recent thing but I mean, oolong knows it we saw goku playing with a corpse like we cannot oh, we did go past that we saw, we saw, like, a cowboy corp he was playing with. Yeah, I'm tapping the skull. I mean, in the manga, in the in the anime, in the Funimation dub, Oolong describes his knowledge and fear of Fire Mountain and the Ox King stemming from being a tour guide. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, that could just be an elaborate joke to as he tries to escape again. In the manga, he says that he, he's kind of surprised that Bulma and Goku haven't heard of it. He's like, everybody... Everybody's heard of this. Like, what? What are you? What are you talking about? Like, they didn't teach you this. Um, so yeah, I mean, to John's point about like time frame, apparently it's been going on for a while. <laughs> but I got the impression the, that the murders were happening before the fire part happened. Yeah, yeah. That I think there's some maybe some blood on the Ox King's hands, comedic blood, but blood. Um, he's a, he's a nice fact. guy, but he's he's got a ledger full of blood. It, I, I do want to point out that as a person who watched Z first, the Ox King's voice, I forgot how different he sounds in Dragon Ball versus like, because when he gets to Z, he's got that 
that very like comedic dad voice and here he's like actually kind of spooky when you first meet him here he's definitely the aping late 90s macho man randy savage because he does the breaking in the middle of words thing that macho man always did so it's the it's kind of that it it's vaguely intimidating but also kind of cute i don't know it's well and start i mean uh you know there was a different dub for the Funimation releases in the late 90s, at least through up until Captain Ginyu, the Funimation dub actor for Ox King is Kyle Hebert, who, of course, goes on to voice Gohan, at least as an adult, um, in about close to 300 episodes from now. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, and it's funny seeing him kind of take on a more comedic role with the ox king even in his quote-unquote more intimidating debut um he's also like kyle's also the narrator for like the latter portion of dragon ball z like next time on that's that's kyle's voice he's also if you've been playing street fighter games since at least street fighter 4 he's the voice of ryu so Um... he has quite the resume so it's very interesting seeing him kind of voice this you know literal oxen man <laughs> that that shows up uh in this episode but I, I i love this episode this is you know we're kind of getting you know moving towards our end game for the peel off saga yeah i really like how they do a lot of little things in the episode how they are introducing this bigger world and goku's backstory a bit with gohan in a way that feels really naturalistic in that sort of everybody's kind of knows of each other but not everything so it avoids a big problem you have in sort of doing these backstory reveals is it can make your world feel small because like, oh, everything's linked to five people. But here it does feel like, oh, I knew someone who knew someone who told me this or I happen to be this student. It's really natural. Like I said, I love with the Ox King when he sees the Nimbus and he's like, oh, only one person would have that. It's so natural. So you don't feel like you're being expertized at. Yeah, you're seeing really nice story. Done. Yeah, the, like, these threads and it, of course, calls back to Roshi, who we learn is more than just a pervert. I mean, he's still a pervert, but there's more. He's a pervert <laughs> I mean, with I, layers. I think one of the the things that I really, I've always Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z. It's always I've always had questions about what the popu- the Earth's population really looks like in this particular universe because. You know, you get, like, later on, you get, like, a bunch of city shots, and it seems like there's a lot of people, but at the same time, it is a very unpopulated place. It feels like, the, you know, the, the population of the Earth now is, like, 8 billion people. It do- never felt like there were billions of people in the Dragon Ball universe, and I think that this kind of underscores that, because, yeah, everybody seems to know everybody, but it does feel natural that they're talking about it. Yeah, it's it's very weird how unpopulated and yet still lively it all feels. It does have this definitely has that journey to the west kind of era rural travel feeling to it still. Even though we have cars, everyone kind of communicates. Though it doesn't communicate directly, you pick things up by sort of travelers sharing stories kind of thing. And yeah, then you have sort of your settlements, but then there's the wastes of miles of nobody. Yeah, which but comes I, in I, for those big fights later. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to come in very handy later. Yeah, everything's nice and empty. I think. What do you think about the one of the, Well, yeah, I, I was thinking ahead. one of the, one of the. I think one of the either a Dyson shoe or one of the video games establishes that instead of like our conventional Earth, like there are four distinct continents, like with West yeah. City and everything, and yeah. Yeah, so. the, the, the Dragon Ball map it like, was in the Dyson shoe, and they've done it in like a bunch of different games too. Like I know Attack of the Saiyans had a pretty good representation of the map. Uh, but yeah, it's a it is a much smaller feeling planet. But John, you we wanted to talk we want to talk about the the pilaf because pilaf, that's one of the additions. Because again, this isn't in the manga, so all the pilaf stuff is new. This pilaf was really fun. I mean, my, my and Shu were back. It was a really nice self contained little sketch. I am having De- my voice actress is definitely getting some time to show off a bit, yeah. which I'm enjoying. Though this does end with pilaf deciding to electrocute people, so that's. But I it, like they're keeping this kind of childish psychopath element of Pilaf, where he's, you're never quite sure whether he's going to pull a prank on you or murder you. You know I don't enjoy this next shot, smirking and clearly delighted at the torture. Yeah, I, you know, and it's becoming more increasingly like Looney Tunes-esque. I mean, he electrocutes himself like Wiley Coyote would do. I do like the animation 
it almost feels out of place how detailed and polished it is the animation of the hands emerging yeah grabbing they was spoon re they were really good it, it yeah. kind of I, it kind of looked okay this is a deep cut for a second but in the third season of the american transformers show that the metallic look of the hands very much reminded me of the way the quint the quintessons move by the way anybody who can go into that deep cut of a transformers <laughs> thing uh you can put it in the comments but yeah it it had that same kind of motion to it and i i always loved when 80s and 90s things did step up their game but yeah you're right it does feel a little out of place <laughs> compared to everything else just someone at the office was gonna make a name for themselves that day by god yeah it's like I'm gonna. It's like, hey, we just need a quick shot of these like metallic hands grabbing like this like little dog boy and and tall lady, and they're like, I got this. <laughs> they will this be the his... best damn hand you've ever seen. <laughs> Magnum <laughs> opus of hands. They're just they they were watching all the stuff that was coming out of the clamp later on, and they were like, <laughs> no, I'm going to be the hands guy. <laughs> <sighs> What, what what do you think of the um kind of the introduction of of Goku and you know their Goku and Chi Chi their first meeting in this episode? I okay. Two first of all, one question: If they had a daughter, do you think that Chi Chi would have dressed their daughter up like she was dressed as a little girl? I think that's a big question. Number two, I find Goku's inability to understand double entendre to be one of my favorite things about the character <laughs> like there there is so much that's just blowing past him in his conversation with chi chi and then it's like is this all girls think about like it it's and also of course you get you you gotta check you gotta check for gender we gotta okay, gotta do a goku gender check real quick i do love that it continues the running gag of every time he does it he gets punished for it and yet he still keeps doing it. <laughs> and yet he still keeps doing it. God bless Goku him. doesn't have pattern recognition, and that's just established as a thing. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, it, this relationship is kind of, it's interesting. It's the bedrock of what will become Dragon Ball. And it's almost, it's a gag here. Because there's, I, I feel like there's no way Toriyama would know that he was going to bring back Chi-Chi as an adult 140 episodes later and or 130 episodes later and then have them marry and have them have two children and but have her be an accomplished martial artist by the time she returns because she's kind of she's kind of i mean understandably like a bit of a scaredy cat here yeah um, you know yeah considering her design is inherent which we'll get to next episode is inherently a very specific reference yeah. i can't believe he had any idea that she was going to be any more than this it'd be cool if so but yeah this definitely feels like hmm well, that was that character I had 10 years ago. Let's quickly bring them back. I think it's also fun that you've got this little cowardly side to Chi-Chi and you get like, again, I love that there's that callback from Z because Gohan also used to be like that. Like Gohan is very much his mother's son. And I think that that's very fun, especially as we get into the more Sharingan parts of the Saiyans later. But like, it's... It's. I really like Chi Chi in this. I all her voice act. There are like some weird things that happen in her voice acting, though. I can't like there like there's a moment where it kind of cuts out and it sounds like it's a different woman. Or if there was a problem uh, with the mic in the is dog. that when she is that when she was on the cloud? Yeah, it sounds. Yes, like that is that is a different voice actor. That's Pois voice actor. Oh. So I did some digging. That is Pois voice actor. I could not find any official reason why that happens. Uh, it's never. I've made. If anyone knows, let me know because I spent a good five hours digging through old interviews. I can only presume maybe the recording was damaged on the day and they had to fill in. But yeah, that's Pois voice actor. But I will agree there are some bits of her acting in this episode and the next one actually that sound a bit weird. I'm not sure if the mic wasn't set up right or if there's some like post-processing they were doing but that you get like hints of like almost distortion. Yeah, like I, I almost thought it was because of the pitch she was hitting. And then I have that moment of like, but Poir is always in that falsetto. So that wouldn't make any sense either. So it, maybe she was recording somewhere else. I'm not 100% sure, but Chi Chi's voice acting sticks out because of that and not always in the best way. No, if anyone has that answer, please. I am now utterly fascinated by this detail. I do like the fact we're getting to see Goku with another child, uh, even though Chi-Chi is as weird of a child as Goku is. I think it's definitely a nice way to take Goku now. Sort of, We've had him had this... He's had the supportive big sister figure. 
He's got the he's had to deal with now a couple of different adult figures who are interesting in their own ways. Roshi kind of falling into a father sort of figure. And now we're seeing him with another kid. I think it's a great way to show off different parts of Goku's personality while still showing that he isn't. Again, there are bits of sadness to Goku's character and his interactions with Chi Chi is one of them for me here. Because again, it shows that. Goku really hasn't done many of like the socialization steps he should have done. And you can really feel that. And it's like, oh, it really reminds you, yeah, this kid was an orphan and an orphan early. Yeah. Well, he's, I mean, and I was thinking about this, like Goku really is like the Mowgli of like Kipling's Jungle Book. You oh, know, exactly. he's in the wilderness, he's forced to raise himself. So he's more comfortable in the wilderness. And this entire seven episodes deep now um you know he's had to learn how to play nice fortunately he's such a cheerful easygoing kid he really does he just doesn't know social cues when it comes to checking for gender uh, <laughs> yeah I'm he's so glad he grows out of that <laughs> yeah i think i'm trying to i think it's all the way through like red ribbon army <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a while it's a running gag that run that has legs for better or worse but if if you think about it again, we're only seven episodes deep. Like, yeah. it's it's incredible how much of I mean they do have the manga as the template, but it is incredible how much um, ground they're covering. I feel like if this had been at the height of Z bloat, we would be seeing a lot more filler, and we aren't. And let's you think, keep in mind we cover a lot with this episode with filler as well because the Pilaf stuff isn't in the manga. The fight with the Ox King isn't in the manga. It's sh- it's very short here. He just sees the Nimbus and immediately goes, oh, Roshi. So they're somehow covering all this ground while still having time to put in a bit of extra. It is my biggest takeaway so far, just how just they're gunning through this stuff. But you wouldn't notice if you were just a casual viewer. Like, obviously, we're writing notes. I have the manga open while I'm watching this. And you realize, oh, wow, they're going through this. But if I was just watching this, I wouldn't realize they were going fast. This just feels the natural pace. There is something to be said about how impressive the pace actually is, especially when you think about like modern, like modern, but modern, well, yeah, modern anime. This is like a 40 year old series, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of modern anime has, has certain pacing issues. I think that you see a lot of pacing issues in shows like My Hero Academia, which I love, by the way. Don't come for me anywhere. I love a lot of these shows I'm going to talk about. Like, Jujutsu Kaisen has pacing issues. Like, they're, like the pacing issues that crop up in modern anime, you don't see here. And I think that that's very interesting because we're able to keep very quick, but we're also able to have these great character moments and these really fun scenes without feeling like we're halting everything to a stop. And I and that is that's incredibly difficult if modern anime has anything to say about it. Oh, yeah, keep in mind we're now seven episodes in. We are approaching what would be the end of the first core if this was released today. I'm continually reminded when watching this of that spe- uh, Surf Dracula meme you see online of, you know, in a modern show if there's a show called Surf Dracula, he wouldn't get the board till the last episode. Yeah. I think if Dragon Ball was today, we wouldn't have got to ball 3 by this point. Heck, we'd be lucky if we got to bought the second collected ball. But here we're sort of we're building to the penultimate one very with, quickly. Yeah, I mean, if and if you are following along with the Viz Media uh, collections, this episode bridges the gap. It covers adapts the last chapter in the first volume and the first chapter in the second volume. So we are we are moving along, man. And I, I think you know it's interesting looking at at anime now that's released in a season format like my hero academia or or uh, one piece or any of that or it's like oh you kind of or jujutsu kaisen is another great example like these guys were running a marathon they just didn't yeah. know that <laughs> they didn't know how long that marathon was going to be including the viewers in japan at the time that had no idea that you know because it was the thing that i think a lot of people kind of forget about dragon ball is it's published in conjunction with the tv show for the, for the majority of its run. And so, you know, even though readers might know what's coming, they have no idea and neither does Toriyama. And it's wild that they're moving at this pace. That's why I think we start to get filler when we get into Z. By the end of Dragon Ball, there is some filler episodes. We just haven't really had the big ones yet. 
the thing that I always loved about Dragon Ball, no matter what, like even when you got to those more bloated filler things, there was it always was at least interesting for the most part filler. It was always kind of something to do. There was always some kind of fun thing that was happening. And part of that is from the comedic roots of it. And the other part of it is that Dragon Ball is just extremely well paced. I know that people make fun of the series now in a lot for its filler, but it is nothing compared to like some of the filler arcs that happened in Naruto, for example. <laughs> like those Naruto filler arcs got crazy bloated. You know, and uh, I there's some, I mean, we've keep referencing if you've listened to past episodes we keep referencing driving school in z i love the other world tournament in z yeah i love the garlic jr stuff in z i think that's really interesting stuff um you know it's it's something unique about dragon ball where they take the enough of that of toriyama's original magic and manage to stretch it out um, i think it really helps the dragon ball setting is wide enough that you can kind of do a lot of stuff with it without their being sort of a major disconnect. So like stuff like driving school works because you're in this world with all sorts of mixed technologies and different places. So you can quite easily go, oh, we'll plonk a new town down here that has this very specific problem. And it doesn't feel as much fillery because it's very easy. Because that what does feel like something that Toriyama would have because we've already had that with Oolong. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, here's this town with a weird problem. I just want to point out as we're sort of ending, heading into the end, we do introduce yeah. something very important here, which is Goku's tail weakness. Yes, I, yeah. we almost forgot to talk about which, the tail. I love how that is introduced. Just Chi Chi grabs it and Goku freaks out. It's so subtle, so much fun, such a nice way of sort of seeding that to viewers so it doesn't feel out of nowhere later. Um, Yamcha's reaction is priceless, where he suddenly starts going, I'm going to punch that tail. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna grab that <laughs> tail with my wolf fang fist. Yeah, it's, I, that, I that, love yeah, how you're he right. Does. That is an incredibly important detail. Um, I love how whenever Yamcha now says wolf fang fist, he does it in the same cadence he uses for the announcement, but not as loud. It's so <laughs> funny with my wolf fang fist. fist. With my wolf fang fist. It, it's <laughs> I. Man, I, I know I've talked about Sabat before, but man, Sabat is just so funny. He's so good at hitting those comedic notes and really selling them. And his Yamcha is so underrated. I mean, everyone rightfully talks about Vegeta and Piccolo and I guess Shenron, but the uh, his... Uh, and that's just within Dragon Ball. I mean, And you mean like 90% of Dragon Ball Z? Yeah, I mean, but his Yamcha is, I think... Uh, he needs more credit for his Yamcha. His Yamcha's great. He's been but, the highlight of these last few episodes. <laughs> yeah. But since we are at the end, gentlemen, it is time for us to uh, get to our final thoughts. And I also want to ask a quick question, too, to wrap up your final thoughts. What is your favorite Dragon Ball opening? Like, Dragon Ball throughout the whole franchise. What is your favorite opening song? Oh, it's got a power from the second half of Z, you know, the da 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 I could argue for any of them, but I do have a soft spot for this first one. We need to bring back the 80s trend of explain the entire plot in the opening song. I think it it's severely underused today, and I just really like it here. If I think mostly because I can't think of this song the same now that a friend pointed out to me that they mention that one of the Dragon Balls is out there in the field. <laughs> and a friend pointed out that's just like such a non-specific and uncool place to put it. It's like, you're going on this massive adventure to find all these magical Dragon Balls. Where are they? In a in field. A field. <laughs> just I love that. My, my favorites, I'm going to be this guy. I love Rock the Dragon. I will never stop loving Rock the Dragon. But yeah, final thoughts for this episode. I love this episode. I think this episode's great. I really love Ox King. I love Chi Chi. I love that we get more fun stuff with the peel off gang. Uh, even though, man, poor, those guys, they do not get enough workers comp. But yeah, I, I love this episode. I think that this is a really great, this is a really great continuation into this adventure. Absolutely. I mean, it's we're we're getting into prime world and mythos building stuff here. So yeah, stay tuned as we go into the. Uh, into the Kamehameha wave for episode eight next week. Oh, wait, John, you didn't give your final thoughts. Oh, a bunch of thoughts. Love this episode. Really fun. 
Uh, just another really good, good bit of world building. Lots of fun. Chi Chi is great. And we're moving, yeah, to an episode that I think will surprise people if they haven't seen this series before. <laughs> but, so yeah. come back next week for that. That's right, everybody. Come back next week. This has been DBR with CBR, Dragon Ball Rewatch. And once again, if you are watching along with us, you can watch on Hulu and Crunchyroll. You can read along with Viz Media. And we'll see you next time on Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball.